the first one. Dr. Oringer received his training at UCLA, New York, Univer New York University, and Bellevue Hospitals. He taught at UCLA, where he serves as assistant clinical professor of surgery for the UCLA Division of Plastic and Reconstructive Surgery for 17 years. He currently serves as adjunct clinical faculty at the John Wayne Cancer Institute. To us, he is a superstar. Yes. It is ever so apparent that he cares profoundly for his patients and their outcomes. And he is unique as a doctor and especially a surgeon because of how much he cares about the nursing staff. I know of no other surgeon who has the level of compassion and appreciation that he has for the nurse at the bedside. <coughs> we often hear from a surgeon what we could be doing better, but it is rare that a surgeon will hunt me down to tell me how incredibly competent the nurses have been with one of his patients. So I now introduce Dr. Jay Horn. Thank you. Thank you all. It's uh, difficult to find words to adequately say thank you to Margaret for her extraordinary generosity, compassion, and caring, and Janice and Mary for your tremendous efforts, and Leslie in making this possible. I certainly am very grateful and uh, perhaps uh, at least equally uh, in terms of, of gratitude, I express to all of you uh, the, the extraordinary uh, feelings that I have for each and every one of you. It, it's, I tell my wife, and I mean it sincerely, when I go to work, it's like I feel it's an extension of my family. You know, you guys work so doggone hard, and nobody knows uh, how hard you work uh, except the guy who's worked with you for some of you, Marisol, for, for 26 years. And um, Marisol and I always joke, uh, we're not getting older, just getting better. And, you know, <laughs> guess, guess that's true, right, Marisol? <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, you know, from the bottom of my heart, I thank all of you. I, I know how hard you work, and I, I know at times what you put up with, and uh, you're the best. You're great. So I heard that. The nurses wanted to hear a bit about what happens after they get to, to see the patients in their early care and you know, what, what happens in the finishing touches. And I was also asked to touch a bit upon pearls of, of nursing care for the various types of reconstruction. So in uh, the next 40 minutes or so, or however long you want me up here, we'll talk about some uh, concepts of current aesthetic breast reconstruction and care of the breast reconstruction patient. In terms of basic types of reconstruction, there is a direct to implant reconstruction, a single stage, use of an implant in some form, uh, and use of one's own tissues. And you've seen examples of all of these reconstructions and I'll show you, I'll show you more. In terms of the one stage reconstruction, uh, the advantage is that it may save the patient an extra procedure. In my opinion, in many instances, as you know, there are things I like to do a few months later to tweak it, to try to make it better, whether it's adding more allograft to fill a postmastectomy hollow up above, where you see those sutures coming out, you know, to hold the graft in place for six, six days or so while it heals, or whether it's fat grafting to fill areas of imperfection, trying to soften those areas. I like to go back and just tweak implant position, uh, soften uh, post-operative defects. So I rarely, if ever, do a one-stage procedure, although good surgeons do, and that's a perfectly reasonable option. I prefer expander reconstructions in general in my first stage. As you know, they're temporary adjustable volume implants, and you've never really seen what they look like out, outside of the patient. but. When the patient goes to my office beginning at about a week, we use that little device that looks like a little mouse, and it's like a stud finder, and it identifies the center magnetic portion of the expander so I can safely put a needle through the skin, through the muscle, uh, and put in fluids within a, few, you know, within a minute. We can add uh, 50 to 100 cc's typically of fluid. So the advantage of expanders and implants as opposed to one's own tissue is that it limits the site of injury to 
the surgical site. There isn't a, a tummy tuck scar, there isn't a back scar, uh, and many people prefer that. Disadvantage of implants is that implants we recognize now require maintenance. They have to be replaced over the course of life. And how frequently that's required is as variable as there are patients. But typically we'll put in an expander, and these were in the days when we weren't doing nipple sparing, but I was still trying to do more innovative incisions, avoiding the traditional transverse scar, which I, uh, those of you who know me, and that's all of you know that I don't like those transverse scars. So even years ago, we were trying to avoid that scar in this young patient, and we did expanders, we put in implants, made nipples from the scar tissue, and then tattoos. So when we're done, even if we take the nipple, in the end, our hope is that the breasts will look very much like breasts, and that's what you oftentimes don't get to see. We have some exciting newer trends in recent years. One of them is the use of Alloderm, which is a human skin product where the cells are removed from donor skin. So it's basically a protein matrix. And whether we are uh, from Greece, Antarctica, whatever our backgrounds, the dermis of our skin is largely the same. The cells which have proteins that the body could reject are removed with acellular matrices and so I don't typically see quote rejection of this tissue because it doesn't have cellular material. But it's in essence a hammock-like framework to support the implant and give a more natural appearance to the reconstruction and also provides a little bit of cover in addition to the thin tissues that are present after mastectomy, a little better cover of the implant. So in the last 10 years or so, we recognize, this was published in 2010, that nipple sparing mastectomy in certain situations, in many situations, appears to be an oncologically reasonable approach and certainly a much more cosmetic approach. So early on, I had this individual come to me and say, uh, I, I want my nipples preserved. And I said, that's a little bit out of the ordinary of what we do. And she said, no, I really want that. I said, okay, well, I'll respect that, but you have to realize it's not what we do. And so I didn't have the courage at the time to do this through the fold, which you know we're now routinely doing, but I started working in that direction. And I made this incision, which was curved low on the outside of the breast so that when you view it from the front, you don't see it. A lot of people go radially. They go up towards the upper part of the outer pole of the breast, and you can see that scar, which I don't find to be at all aesthetic. It's highly visible, whereas if you curve the scar down like that, uh, it's not visible from the front. And then as we got better implants and we got allograft and better techniques, we learned that incisional approaches that mimic, that mimic aesthetic, Frank, there will be a CME question on this slide, so just. <laughs> uh, it looks like a very complex algorithm. The, the reality is that if a physician looks at this and really just reads each box, it's a very simple approach that could teach the guy in any part of the country how to select a reasonable incision. And, and it's silly to say that there's only one approach. Medicine is art. You know, many approaches to do a fine job. But this is at least a place to begin where people can, you know, any guy his first year out in practice can go and say, what should I do? Okay, this is reasonable. And that was really my goal. And I recognized, before I found this article, I recognized that there are some blood vessels that drain at the six o'clock position, the nipple. And if we made an incision that was lateral to that, we could potentially preserve those vessels, draining the nipple, avoid congestion, and still do a nice mastectomy since the bulk of the breast tissue is in the outer part of the breast. So making an incision in the lateral inframammary fold, which you know, people were doing, I realized that there's an anatomical basis for doing that. Exposure to the breast, avoidance of vessels that drain the nipple at the six o'clock position. So a typical patient in the pre-op area, we mark the expander positioning that we anticipate, and we mark our incisions, and then we put the expanders in. The expanders look like 
semi-rigid implants, semi-rigid breasts, look somewhat like encapsulated breasts. But if it's done well, at least you can wear a bathing suit, you can wear a, a fairly low cut dress and it looks acceptable. Typically three months after surgery, if there's no chemo required or no radiation required, or a month after chemotherapy, if that's required, we go back and I often do some fat grafting. I'm not a huge proponent of fat grafting. I think it, the volume take is highly variable. Benign cysts and lumps can form that can worry a patient, but in certain situations, like in the hollowing in the infraclavicular area, it's reasonable to consider putting some fat there if it's necessary, recognizing that only a small portion of it will take. And I think we have to tell patients that and not give them hopes that a deep hole is going to be filled with one treatment. It's just not. And I put more allograft up in that area, and I put allograft medially to further hide implant imperfections and rippling. So this patient has a little bit of a, of a scoliosis, right shoulder's a little bit higher. So the, her right, I looked and I said, I know I got them in the same position, but as I looked at her shoulder, I saw her right shoulder was a bit higher. But quite, quite natural, I think, in overall appearance. You don't really see much implant rippling. I did fat graft her. Her incision is hidden in the outer shadow of the inframammary fold. So can you guys see it all? OK. Um, so I think good, good scar position really um, can make the scar fairly inconspicuous. Another example, she had a biopsy in her inner breast, unfortunately, on the right. But her main mastectomy scars and reconstructions were done through that inframammary incision. Um, didn't make her a lot bigger than she was before, just simply gave her a little more upper pole fill. This patient came with cancer having undergone previous augmentation. Her left breast prior to her mastectomies, it obviously drops in the years that she, since she was augmented, I assume. I, I don't know exactly how she looked to begin with, but my goal of the reconstruction was to keep her large as she wished as before her mastectomy. And I really wanted to try to improve the asymmetry that she had, if that was possible. And I'm pleased. I think, I think we made some improvement. It became apparent to me over time that patients who had droopy breasts wanted their nipples to be saved also. And so it then became a challenge to determine, could we do that? It seemed feasible based upon blood supply considerations. And so... I started using what I call the mid-mammary infrarealer incision. And it's, a, it's in the center part of the breast from the 6 o'clock position of the areola down near the fold. And so this patient had an uh, expander with allograft reconstruction followed by implant. And if you look at her scar at the 6 o'clock position, that's the scar we think of for a breast lift, right? Except... I don't make scars around the nipple. I don't believe in doing that in the mastectomy setting because the blood supply of the nipple is already severely affected by the removal of the breast. So the blood supply to the nipple coming from below is removed when you remove the breast. It's the subdermal plexus that keeps the nipple areolar complex viable under the skin. So I don't like to make incisions around the nipple. And as you'll see, I go to great lengths to try to avoid an incision around the nipple. So then we started seeing in the last few years BRCA positive patients and lovely young women with large breasts who say, Dr. O, you know, I'm told that I probably gonna have to lose my nipples because my breasts are so low. And I mean, you look at that and you say, her nipples are down to her elbows, literally. I wasn't a hundred percent certain that we could keep the nipples but I was sure gonna try and so and she was a great patient very reasonable lovely person and I said you know if you recognize that there's a chance they'll either be too low or they'll be possibly not viable I think that it makes sense to me that if we if we take an ellipse of skin underneath the areola down in the lower pole of the breast. You know, when you close an ellipse, you can see how things move up when you close it. The, the scar moves down and things get pushed up as you close that ellipse. I have a, I have a diagrammatic uh, slide that shows just that. As you close the ellipse, things move upward, okay? So I thought, well, 
I can pull the nipple up on the mastectomy skin and if I take some of that extra skin out from underneath, which she needs to have done anyway, perhaps I can get her nipples into an acceptable position. Uh, certainly worth the, the shot. So now we have some dog ears, you know, the sewing dog ears where you excise something and you get that prominence at the end of your scar. You've heard me use the term dog ear. I use those dog ears to advantage. I said, oh, if I am lucky, maybe those will be where I want a nipple. And then we did a three-dimensional tattoo, okay? And so we made the nipple a little darker with a little circle around it that's darker to give it a three-dimensional appearance, okay? And so then we used, there are some newer implants that have a bit less rippling uh, that I think are exciting. I think implants are moving in the right direction, not perfect yet. There is no such thing as a perfect implant yet, but we're working on it and things are improving. And so that was her. You'll see a variety of implants that have various projections. The highest profile implants I tend to use in my reconstructions because people complain that the, the reconstructed breast tends to be too flat. And, and that's what we hear most often. And so because of that, I'll always use a high profile implant. If someone wants to be augmented, I'll tend to use a lower profile implant, meaning it's wider and a little flatter. And you'll hear the term gummy bear, or shaped implants. For several years, I used the shaped implants. I think that it's a um, perfectly acceptable option. I found some people felt that it was a little bit uh, firmer and it has the capacity, it, it can shift a bit, and because it has shape, if it shifts, you have some asymmetry. And so I sort of migrated a bit more towards the round again, but either, either are viable options. So now addressing the nursing issues of caring for these patients. What do I worry about? As you know, I worry about tissue loss. And so what do we do? You know, I'll call Frank, you know, Frank, Frank never disturbs me, but you know, he knows I call all hours of the night to check on the patient and you know, is, are the nipples pink, the skin look okay? And we put on um, the bear hugger for 48 hours, something I started doing more recently because I think that that warm air blowing on the skin causes vasodilation. And if you vasodilate the skin, perhaps you get better perfusion. It seems to make sense. At least as importantly, I hydrate the patient very well. You know, the night of surgery, patients have pain, they use the PCA, they may use Ativan or Valium, other, other relaxants, and those do what to the blood pressure? They, they drop it. And so you drop the blood pressure, you decrease the perfusion to the skin, and that obviously is exactly what we don't want. So I think it's very important to keep the patient very well hydrated, really important. And you know, I often, I often run LR at 150 an hour. I often give patients five liters of fluid routinely in the OR as long as they have no cardiac or renal disease and they can handle the load. They'll get rid of what they don't need, but they'll hold on to what they do need. So, you know, as a general rule of thumb, I like one cc per kilo per hour. So, you know, someone weighs about 120 pounds, you wanna be making 50 cc's an hour of urine. 12 hour shift, 600 cc's of urine minimum. That's a good rule of thumb. You know, we're all, we're all artists, we're all healthcare practitioners who deal with patients. There are, no, there are no hard and set rules, but certain guidelines I think are helpful. We want to avoid hypotension. It's nice to keep the systolic pressure above 100. You know, when the nipples look a little congested or the mastectomy skin flaps have that, that kind of darker appearance and we're worried it's kind of purplish, not the blue bruise, but that awful purple look. I like to use nitro paste and I often use the smallest amount possible to just cover the surface. And I'll typically do that every six hours, give or take, um, watching the blood pressure and watching for headaches. Nitro paste is a cardiac med, but it also will dilate the blood vessels of the skin. It'll drop your blood pressure and cause headaches. So be cognizant of not dropping the pressure, putting as little as possible to cover the ischemic looking area. The smallest amount that'll cover it is what you wanna use. After 48 hours, if the skin hasn't turned around, then I like to use silvadine. Silvadine is a wonderful topical preparation, an antibacterial that actually has some penetration into the deeper skin. 
into the dermis so that it keeps bacterial content down and tends to promote survival of the skin by avoiding bacterial death of, of tissue, okay? Preventing infection. You guys do such a fantastic job. I mean, I, I just feel so fortunate, among the many reasons I'm so fortunate to work with you, you do such a great job in preventing infection. Um, and I think that the hand washing is constantly done with every patient. I mean, we all do that. We all have biopatch, those antibacterial discs that you see on my patients. I think those things are great. They're little, they look like little lifesavers that my mom used to give me to eat. And you, you put those around the drains and they have antibacterial chlorhexidine in them. You put those around your drains and I put an opsite to get an airtight seal. And we really seem to, to be very fortunate, even when some of these drains are in for two weeks, they seem to fortunately do well with that approach. So I think, I think people should do that. They should use bio patches and they should use offsites. Bio patches have been shown to decrease line sepsis with CVPs. It just makes sense that they're gonna work for drains that go to foreign bodies. Right, Susan? Okay. Second option for reconstructing tissue. Reconstructing the breast is use of your own tissue. Most often uh, we use the back or we use the tummy. The latissimus flaps a broad muscle that has a great blood supply, um, wonderful reconstructive tool when necessary. So a patient like this who came to me with an augmentation and said, I work out all the time, I'm physically fit, I like large breasts on my small frame, it's my aesthetic, it's what I've been used to my whole adult life. And I said, but you're so thin, I'm not sure that we could get an implant reconstruction that looks acceptable and we have to take the nipples, so we're further limited. And as I thought about it, I said, if we, if we could create scars on the back that be, could be hidden in your bathing suit, would that be acceptable for better looking breasts in the front? And she said, absolutely. And so I had her bring, bring her bra, we marked the bra outline in pre-op, and then we designed latissimus flaps, the muscle plan to rotate from the back to the front with attached skin to make the new nipple. And we did our mastectomies with those incisions around the nipple. We did all the surgery with that little incision there and the incision used to take that little football of skin off. Okay, I got the whole muscle up and did my thing. These were her scars on the back, hidden in her bra. And these were her new breasts, large breasts, where a lot of the imperfections of her previous augmentation were corrected. The axillary hollow was filled by the muscle coming through from the back to the front. You see all right, Anna? Huh? Yeah. Okay. And then we used the, the skin paddle to make the new nipple. And we made, and the skin of the back, which was vascularized, and the fat under it was great to make a little nipple mound. And then I tattooed color to hide the scar. And so the challenge was how to make breasts that really could fool someone because that's what she needed. And so she said, I'm okay with that plan if you want to use the back skin and muscle, if you think it's going to give me a better appearance. And I did feel that, and we had ended up taking her nipples because she was young and the tumor was in close proximity, fairly close proximity to the nipple. So I did the latissimus muscle, muscle and skin, the skin used to make the new nipples. That's all tattoo. You know, I made the nipple from the skin of the back and then I tattooed it. And we tattooed the scar on the perimeter. And then that was her from the side, and that was her from the back. And the, and the nice thing is, and what's so gratifying is, she's many years out now. She just, uh, she had two little boys and then she just had, she's moved on with life and, uh, you know, we stay in touch, you know, it's the best. Uh, as you know, in the last couple decades, we've been doing free tram flaps, avoiding the tunneled muscle, the muscle where we used to take all the muscle and tunnel it up and hope that it would live. The free flap, sort of an all or none. It either is 100% successful or 100% unsuccessful. But you get much less fat necrosis with this than with the traditional approach. And I think you get better integrity of the abdominal wall. So patients like this who have some tummy tissue, enough to make breasts that are similar to their original size, that's a good approach. 
And so there are no implants, as you know. You monitor these flaps and do such a fantastic job doing it. Again, among the many, many zillions of reasons that I'm appreciate, appreciative of Laura. Right, Laura? Um, you guys do such a great job with these patients. So that was her post-op. Nice uh, improvement in abdominal contour. And a lot of times these people work out afterwards saying, oh, I'm in pretty good shape. You got me jump started. So that's nice. And then even more recently, DIEP flaps are almost total muscle sparing. Very complex, difficult operations, but can have uh, pleasing outcomes. And this patient had an old breast reduction, and you can see her scars there. And we did nipple delays because she had scars around the nipple. So a couple weeks before the surgery, we went in, lifted the nipples up off the breast, tried to threaten the blood supply to some extent, which is a delay procedure. You lift the nipple up, you leave it attached to the skin, but you lift it off of its underlying blood supply. Over the next 10 days or so, the blood supply, if it lives, which it usually does, if the nipple lives, it then gets a better blood supply by mechanisms that we don't entirely understand. And so we used her old vertical scar to do the nipple delay and then to do her mastectomies and to do her free flap reconstructions, her DIAP flap reconstructions. So that's her before her mastectomies, having had previous breast reduction. That's her with her healed DIAP flaps, no implants, fat all from the tummy, okay? The final flap, which I no longer do, but which is also an option, it's good to know, is something called a gluteal flap. The buttock is also a site of tissue that can be used for reconstruction. If someone's had a tummy tuck, they've had a lot of liposuction, they're just really thin on the tummy, they've had radiation, they're not good candidates for a tummy flap, or they don't want a back flap, or they don't want an implant. We can use the buttock. Now, I met this patient early in my career, referred by my revered chief in my training. And I, when I met her, I was talking to her, and, and she's a very lovely woman. I thought, how bad can this problem be? And then I remembered that it was my chief. It's like your boss referring you someone. And I said to myself, this is probably a difficult problem because he's referred her. And when I saw her, I said, wow, this is really difficult because there is no possibility of putting an expander under this. She had a cystic hygroma at birth, a large area of uh, benign tumor, but locally invasive, removed at birth. So she never developed the breast. She had terrible damage to the abdominal wall and also terrible damage to the back. I couldn't use her latissimus. So I put a tissue expander in to stretch the skin up here so I could bring her nipple down a bit. And then we took a gluteal flap and transplanted it to the chest wall. And that was her, that was her with the buttock skin here and the buttock fat there. And then I was able to revise her scar because it was no longer so tight. And then she went on to have a couple of children and it's a nice story. I just saw her over 20 years out. So flap care, hydration again, at least one cc per kilo per hour for at least 48 hours to keep the anastomoses open and the microcirculation going. Avoidance of hypothermia, avoidance of pressure. Usually with the free flaps, most often we hook into the internal mammary vessels which run adjacent to the sternum. These vessels uh, could in theory be compressed by a seat belt or by a pillow or if the patient would happen to roll over onto her stomach early postoperatively. So we try to avoid pressure to the area of the connection, the pedicle, that you monitor so capably for the first couple of weeks. We like a flap to be pink, not blue, which means that the vein may not be draining, venous congestion. <laughs> yeah, Helen. <laughs> or white, which means it may not be adequately perfused. We like the refill to be between two and four seconds, not faster, because if it's faster, the vein may not be draining and it's congested. If it's slower than that, there may not be adequate arterial inflow. We don't like it to be too tense, but we don't like it to be so soft that it doesn't have any refill. We like a Doppler that's polyphasic. You like to hear, whoosh, whoosh, that's the artery. How many times you guys have heard me do that? And the, and the vein is, whoosh, 
just a constant kind of a dull roar because it doesn't have the elastic walls of the artery. So you can hear, if everything is good, you can hear an artery and a vein superimposed as you're listening with a Doppler. Most recently, we've been using a tissue oxygenation monitor called the Vioptics Monitor. Seems to be a pretty good system. As a rule of thumb, we like the oxygen saturation in the tissues to be 35%, and it's a monitor that's so, uh, sewn to the skin. We don't like to see a change in saturation of more than 20% over a two-hour period. Ox also tells you it has to be at least at 80 or the system doesn't work. And so what you don't want to see is the patient doing great for three, four hours after surgery, and then all of a sudden you see this over a period of an hour and 20 minutes where the tissue goes from a SAT of 95% to a SAT of 60%. That tells you something's going on with your anastomoses, okay? So today we have newer incisions, more common nipple sparing mastectomies, innovative biological materials such as alloderm, better implants and surgical techniques. These certainly allow us to achieve ever improving more aesthetic outcomes for the patients for whom all of us are so privileged to care, especially Margaret. We're all teammates on a team captained by our patients, and it's important to remember that they are the captain of their ship, and I think we all know that. You know, you, you, guys, you guys epitomize compassion, but they are the captains. They have to be empowered. They have to know that we're standing with them. We're there to hold them up. We're there to be with them. They're the captains, you know, and, and they have to be informed by us, by the physicians. We have to inform them. We have to educate them. They have to make their decisions, then all of us have to support them as they make their choices. We're there because of the people we're so honored to care for, and we're there for them, and we're there because of them. This isn't something that needs to be said to this group because of any group of nurses I've ever known, this group realizes this. But if we become a pilot, which is really our goal for this day, that the compassionate care and the wonderful care that permeates Caritas move on to the rest of the hospital and hopefully move on from there. Regardless of the day that we're having, you know, whether our dog chewed up our kid's term paper or, or you stepped in it when you walked onto the grass that morning going to your car, their day's much worse. And what I have to say, because they've lost perhaps a, a part of themselves, they've lost control. Everything that Margaret so eloquently said is true. They, they, they've put themselves, they've honored us by putting their control in our hands while they're there. And powerful, brilliant people like Margaret are all of a sudden in positions where they put themselves in our hands. So what all of you do, and I've heard it over and over and over, you make their journeys memorable because of your kindness and compassion. And you do that. If we can get everybody to do that in, in healthcare, boy, we're golden. So I want to thank all of you, my wonderful friends. You know you're my colleagues, both at Caritas, the hospital for making the last 26 years great. And let's keep going. You know, may your compassion and your dedicated care only make it better for patients, and let's just get better and better. I want to thank Margaret, and I want to thank Big Al for being her love and support and <laughs> being my great friend. Uh, truly, Margaret and Al, your extraordinary caring and your kindness and your generosity are unparalleled, and uh, it means so very much. And again, I want to thank you all. Dr. So I'll just say something that you hear from me every day on the floor. Yeah. <laughs> so it's two minutes of your time. Dr. Oringer, on behalf of all the nurses and CNAs working on the Caritas Unit, we would like to thank you for your kindness and overall excellence. 
We love watching your patience. We witnessed firsthand <coughs> your attentiveness, encouragement, and compassion for them. Every patient is like a work of art for you. And they know that, yeah. And you make them feel so beautiful. You recognize our hard work and never forget to thank and encourage us. We truly appreciate that. You are a pleasure to work with. <laughs> Easy on the ice too. <laughs> We are constantly learning from your past experience, well, from your youthful enthusiasm. Because uh, sometimes it's like five years old. Ah, no, look! <laughs> and, and enormous dedication. You are an inspiration to us and your patients. Please accept our thanks and admiration as we all look forward to continuing to learn from you and working together. Come on, you're looking at a guy who my son says cries at Shrek. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are the gift. Oh. Huh? Oh my gosh, it is so beautiful. Oh, it says, in honor of Dr. Jay Orniger for your compassionate and loving care of patients and staff, the Caritas staff of St. John's Health Center. It's so beautiful. The feeling couldn't be more mutual. Thank you so much. That is so beautiful. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Let's do this again next week. <laughs>